All right. Good morning. morning. It is really good to see. Oh, that's a lot of enthusiasm. I like that. Good deal. Well, it's really good to see you today. Uh, You know, I think kind of summertime and not the temperature. Aren't you glad that it's nice today? Man, I'll take this. Uh, This is really, really nice. But uh, I can tell that summer's kind of already hit us. I know a lot of our folks are out of town trying to take those vacations. I knew it was coming, Roy, because on Facebook this week, kids were kind of getting their advancement to the next grade, and some were graduating and things of that nature. And so uh, I knew that we were about to hit that cycle, but it looks like a number of our folks are already out for uh, for vacation, which is good. That means they'll be back, and we won't have to anticipate another one of these. So uh, anyway, gas prices keep going up. Nobody will be taking a vacation, so, except the rich people, like Roy. (laughs) All right, well, hey, we are really glad that you're here, and uh, we have guests that are with us today. I've met a few of you, some I didn't get around to, uh, but I know that we have some first-time guests here. Uh, Yolanda, it's good to have you today. Thank you for being here today. All right. Uh, We do have a number of returning guests that are with us, and we're really glad that you're here. Let me ask you, if you are a first-time guest today, uh, if you will look at the screen, uh, there is a telephone number there. If you'll take out your smartphone for just a second, uh, God's not going to kill you for doing it. Be sure to take it out. And uh, you can text the word welcome to that telephone number, and it's going to ask you for a little bit of information like your name and I believe your email address. And what that's going to do is provide us an opportunity to communicate with you over the next six weeks. I believe what you'll be doing is getting an email once a week for about six weeks. We won't be constantly doing that and harassing you, but if you'd like to respond to those emails, you can. It will send me uh, your reply, your response. It's even got a little survey on there, and I know that I communicated with one of you just this last week, and I appreciate all of your comments and the things that you shared, your encouragement, and uh, so uh, if you ever uh, uh, have an opportunity to do that, be sure to do it. We would love to hear Uh, from you about what God is doing in your life through our ministry here. Uh, A couple of things that are going on, but I'm going to save that for the very end, as well as Roy's going to be sharing some things. Right now, we've come to worship the Lord. All right, seven of you have. And uh, I know the rest of you came for donuts, but, but you know, we'll catch people wherever they are, right? All right. Maybe at some point you'll be thankful for the donut, okay? All right. But we are glad that you're here. I'm going to ask you to stand right now and let's begin our time of worship. Good morning, guys. Why don't you worship with us? See him now, the King of heaven. Son of God, enthroned above, a heavy cross upon his shoulders, carried for us, carried for us. See him now, our King surrender, final word, a perfect love. Hear his cry, Father, forgive them. Spoken for us, spoken for us. When he said it is finished, our hope had just begun. The grave has lost its hold. Arise, the stone is gone. Our God reigns forever. His name alone, Jesus came and paid it all, then he rose, then he rose. Now we rise by his spirit, in his name we overcome. All our hope and this same power living in us, living in us. For our sin is defeated. For the war has now been won. The grave, the grave has lost its hold. Arise, the stone is gone. Our God reigns forevermore. All praise 
Sing a little louder. 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 Come on, let's sing louder. Sing a little louder.
Amen. As we prepare to receive our offering today, let's pray. Let's offer thanksgiving to the Lord. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today to begin a new week. And Father, we're thankful that you're already at Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. You're already, you're already there for next Sunday. You are not limited by time and space. And so, Father, we want to be sensitive to you and to listen to your spirit so we might know how to go into our week being sensitive to have some understanding of what's coming and how we might line up our will with your will. We thank you for being such a magnificent God, the God who was, the God who is, and the God who is to come. Thank you for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We continue our uh, series of sermons entitled The Return of the King. I want to begin today by reading our uh, passage, not all of it. We're actually going to take two weeks to cover the verses that uh, I have given our AV team. Uh, they got this uh, earlier, uh, well, a few days ago, and uh, I wasn't able to get to the pre-service meeting, but uh, I know they had the meeting. There was a lot of angst among those that were in the meeting because I have 41 verses and so they were concerned. If you see a Domino's guy walk in, ignore it. They, they thought they had to order lunch. So, But, uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, we're not going to cover all 41 verses uh, today. We're going to break this apart uh, because there's a lot here to digest. My desire today is to be both a prophet and a teacher. All right? My desire is to be both a prophet and a teacher because there are some things coming you need to be aware of. And uh, we need to be prepared. Uh, and with the nature of my giftedness, I'm a teacher. And that's really what I want to put on display today, not my teaching ability, but the information that I want to communicate to you. I want to be able to give it to you in a way that you can digest it and, and be able to uh, build your faith and your understanding, give you some prudence uh, and, some, and some wisdom. Uh, Matthew chapter 24 Matthew chapter 24, uh, Luke uh, chapter uh, 21, and then uh, some of the sections in the Gospel of Mark basically cover this same event in the life of Jesus and his disciples. Uh, you're going to find um, a variety of uh, information in each one of these Gospels that's going to be unique to the Gospel. I say that because there's no contradiction in what's listed. It's if the three of us were listening to somebody talk and you mark certain things in the conversation uh, and I mark something different in the conversation and, and Shannon marks something different. There's no contradiction. It's just what by the remembrance and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, in this case, uh, chooses to call and to, to write down. And so there's no contradiction. I have chosen to use the Gospel of Matthew uh, today uh, primarily because... 
uh, Matthew uh, is trying to convince the nation of Israel to the Jew that Jesus is the king, that he is the promised Messiah. That's his purpose in writing. And every gospel has an audience. It has a purpose, all right? Now, one of the things I'll throw out, and this is my teacher stuff coming out, okay? Uh, this gospel was written about 45 A.D., all right? It's, that's very important because some people would have us to believe that it was written after 70 A.D., all right? Now, why is that important? Because the attempt by those who put a later date on it is to dismiss the prophetic teaching of Jesus in Matthew 24 and 25. If these events occurred after 70 A.D., then what these theologians are telling us is that these events have already happened. All right? It's just history, okay? It's not looking to the future. And yet, we know that uh, through study that this would have been an early gospel, about 45 A.D., uh, although Jesus said them around 29 or 30 A.D., about 15 years uh, after. But that's important to know, Okay? The, the, you know, uh, I'll go ahead and give you, give you this as well. Uh, and if you're taking notes, and I, and I hope you are, you, your, your bias, if you will, in coming to this section of Scripture, the uh, Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25. And by the way, all, all of us have some bias as we come into the Word of God. It's why we have to pray for the Holy Spirit to help us interpret it. I was talking to a gentleman today, who was, or this week rather, uh, who, who was familiar with what I taught last week. He's, he's not a member of our fellowship. But, but he, he told me, he, 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 he argued with me about some of the, the things that I preached last week. And uh, I asked him, I said, well, what is, your, what is your theological bias? And he was offended by that. He said, well, I'm a Christian, and I just take the Bible for what it says. Well, that sounds good. But the fact is that all of us have been influenced in some way. Right, and, and that could be from your uh, secular background. It could be from your Baptist background. It could be from your Church of Christ background. It could be from your Pentecostal background, your Assembly of God background, your Catholic background, your agnostic background, your atheist background, your Muslim background, your Hindu background. I mean, honestly, let's get over the whole thing that we're not influenced. We are by nature influenced by other people. We've got to go to the Word of God and humbly say, God, teach me. Somebody has influenced you. And, th and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Thank God for the faith of other people who brought us to a particular point, right? We're not here to criticize other people because, you know, we, we might see things a little differently, but, but the truth of the matter is we must have the Holy Spirit be our teacher, and what I'm going to share with you today is a reflection of what I understand, but you, after this, have your own personal responsibility to get into the Word of God. I promise you that when you stand before Christ as a believer at the judgment seat of Christ, and he asks you and speaks to you about your life, you're not going to be able to go, but Brother Tim said. And you say, why? Well, because Brother Tim's either been in front of you or is behind you in the line. I have my own accountability, Okay. But you have your personal responsibility to know God personally, to know Christ personally, the Spirit of God personally, the Word of God personally, okay? And so uh, some of the biases that we might have in our understanding of prophetic Scripture are uh, a group of people who believe that all of this is in the past, preterist is the term that is used, preterist. They believe all of this has occurred in the past, that it occurred somewhere between 70 A.D. and 476 at the destruction of Rome. Some believe that all of these events that Jesus talks about and even the entire book of Revelation occurred historically in the past between the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. and the destruction of the Roman Empire in 476. That's going to influence how you interpret this. And if you believe that Matthew 24 has already happened, you need a perforated Bible, just tear it out and throw it away. If the book of Revelation has already happened, you need the perforated Bible, tear it out and throw it away. It's happened, it's done, it makes no difference. All right? There's also a historical perspective. 
The historical perspective is this, that all of these events occur between the writing of Revelation uh, and the time of John the Baptist, I might even back up, from the time of John the Baptist all the way until the second coming of Christ. So it's historical. So some of these things have already occurred, and some of these things are occurring, and some of these things will occur in, in the future, all right? Uh, there is also uh, a perspective uh, that, that all of this uh, is in the future. That's where I land. Surprise is over. The anticipation has now been met. I believe that all of these things we see in Matthew 24, Matthew 25, and in the book of Revelation, outside of the first three chapters, are in the future. Now, I will say this. I believe in the immediate future. By the way, there's a fourth opinion and a bias, and that is what we call an eclectic, eclectic view. What is that? That it's all mixed up and who knows. We can do better than that. We can do better than that. Now, you've got a chart. The chart is the best that I can come up with in, in this sense. This is uh, a, a, a good chart, uh, but it, it doesn't line up fully with how I interpret Matthew 24, 25, and Revelation. I'll show you the differences. I believe that in the first part of the tribulation period, the 70th week of Daniel, that, that the, and I'll go into greater detail here in a minute, but you see the first seven seals? In the book of Revelation, let me throw this out. In the book of Revelation, there are, there are seven seals, and I'm not talking about an animal. What is a seal? It's like a stamp, right? It's wax. You seal a letter with it, right? So it's not opened until the right person opens it. Somebody with authority has to open it. Somebody with the right has to open it, okay? And by the way, there's only one who has the authority to do that, and that's Jesus. Nobody else. Nobody else. So we're talking about a seal on seven scrolls. And then you have seven trumpets. And then you have seven vowels or bowls, B-O-W-L-S, bowls of wrath that are poured out. This, this is how you can have an understanding of Matthew 24, 25, and Revelation, basically from chapter 6 to chapter 19. Understand that there are some intervals, and you'll see that on the chart, there are some intervals that interrupt the succession of these things only in the sense that John is giving you greater insight into some things that are happening. But if we were to take those out, not suggesting that we do, but if we take those out and we were to lay out Revelation 6 through 19, chapter 6 through 19, you're going to have these judgments over a period of seven years. I believe that the first four in particular, the, the first four of the seven seals is going to occur in the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. Then there's going to be a significant event that occurs in the middle of the tribulation period, that seven years, okay? And then at the end, you're going to have the, the fifth seal broken, the sixth seal broken, the seventh seal, by the way, if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, when the seventh seal is broken, all that does is open up the seven uh, trumpet judgments. When the seventh trumpet is blown, all it does is what? Announce the seven bold judgments. And the thing I want you to understand from my perspective, and as I hopefully walk you through this and it makes sense to you, is that, again, in the first three and a half years, the first 42 months, you're going to have f uh, four of these seals broken. This event occurs that we'll talk about. Then you'll have the fifth seal, the sixth seal, the seventh seal, and then you'll have seven trumpets and seven bowls. What I want you to understand is the, the, the imagery that Jesus gives us in his teaching on the end times is that the end times are like a woman giving birth. That's real important to understand. That's the imagery. That's, that, that's the picture that Jesus wants you to have, all right? And by the way, the Apostle Paul says this in Romans chapter 8, that the very creation 
groans for the revelation of the sons of God. Even creation groans for what? The return of the Lord. For the manifestation of his kingdom on the earth. For the glorification of his saints. Even the earth groans for that. Creation itself groans for that. The imagery is giving birth. Men don't understand that, but ask your wife. She can tell you what that is. How does that, how does that process normally begin? You begin to have pain, but the pain's not as intense at the front end as it is at the back end, but you begin to have pain. Is the pain constant? No, it's separated by intervals of time. You have a pain, it passes. You have a pain, and it passes. You have a pain, and it passes. Jesus identifies what's happening in the earth at the front part of the tribulation as the beginning of sorrows. Pain, interval of time. Pain, interval of time. Pain, interval of time. And then what happens in pregnancy? Well, we pass that, and then what do we do? Well, we start getting a little more frequently, and the pains and the contractions get to be a little more severe, right? Okay? And then right before the baby's born, what happens? What's happening to the pain in the intervals? The intervals get shorter, the pain gets greater. Boom, 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 boom. That's how you have to see prophetic uh, teaching. You have to see it in Matthew 24, Matthew 25. You have to see it in the book of Revelation. As the tribulation period begins, there's what? There's a pain. Separation of time. There's a pain. Separation of time. There's a pain. Separation of time. There's a pain. A separation of time. Now we cross the three and a half year mark, and now what happens? Now, they're, now the pain's beginning to get a little more severe. Now the things are getting closer, right? And as you get toward the end of the tribulation period, there is immense pain, and it's what? Coming frequently. Okay. Matthew 24, verse 1. Jesus was leaving the temple grounds. His disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Verse 3. Do we have a verse 3? Go to verse, yeah. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. I want you to leave that up. The Bible says that at the end of the day, Jesus leaves the temple and he goes out to the Mount of Olives. So let's get a setting here, okay? We need to get a setting here. This is Passion Week. What do I mean by Passion Week? It's the week between the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem to what? The resurrection on Sunday. This occurs on Wednesday. It's at the end of the day on Wednesday. Well, what, what's happened before then? Well, that's important for us to understand, okay? Because on Tuesday, Jesus has gone into this same temple, and he has what? He's wrecked it. He's run everybody out of it that was selling and manipulating the system. He, he runs all of the animals out, and he clears out the temple. Why? Because on Wednesday, he's going to teach all day in the temple. All day. It's the first time in thousands of years, or at least hundreds of years, that there has been any truth taught in the temple. That's why he cleanses it. He cleanses it so he, the teacher, the Messiah, can come in and teach them. And Wednesday is about teaching. And he teaches all day long. And now we've come to the end of the day. Jesus walks out of the temple with his disciples. They go out of the eastern gate. They go down and cross the Kidron Valley and a stream that runs through the Kidron Valley. He goes up a slope on the Mount of Olives and he sits down after teaching all day. And the disciples come to him privately and say, tell us. They actually asked two questions, not three. Now, you say, well, it looks like three. Well, it looks like three, but one is related to the other. The first question is, 
When is this going to happen? Let me put it into a context, Kirby, that we can understand. You have to understand the nationalism and the patriotism that these Jewish men felt when they walked out of the temple, and it was absolutely magnificent. I mean, Herod even added to the construction of that temple, and he, he added to it for 40 years. And all of the surrounding buildings there on that mountaintop, if you will, magnificent. It would be like going to Washington, D.C. That, that's the image I want you to get. You've seen the White House. You've seen the Lincoln Memorial. You've seen the Washington Monument. You've walked them all. You, you've seen the, uh, the Jefferson Memorial. These magnificent buildings. And, and how many of you have seen those in person? It's magnificent, isn't it? These, uh, Washington, D.C. Is, 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 is quite a testimony in, in, in many ways. It was built that way on purpose. I don't know about you, but when I visited the pride, being an American, Jesus has told them what? Look at the, all this. Not a stone will be left on the other. Now put yourself in that situation as American. What if I came to you and prophetically told you that the Washington Monument will fall, the, mem the, memori the Lincoln Memorial will fall, the White House will be destroyed, the Capitol building will be destroyed. All, all of that is going to be destroyed. As an American, your first question is what? When? When is that going to happen? And that's what, that, that's what they ask. Tell us. When, when will these things be? And, and here's the, the second question, kind of tied together with another one. And what will be the sign? Now, that's important to a Jew. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that, that Greeks seek after wisdom, but Jews look for a sign. That's how God directed them throughout their history. A sign shall be given to you. A virgin will conceive and bring forth a son. Isaiah 7, 14. This shall be a sign unto you. The, the night that Jesus was born to those shepherds. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. There's a sign. There's a sign. There's a sign. When is this going to happen? And what is the sign of your coming? Coming for what? What were they looking for? A kingdom. They knew their Old Testament scriptures. Over and over and over and over, it prophesied a coming son of David, a descendant of Abraham, who would sit upon a throne in a golden age and bring peace to the world and prosperity like it had never known, who would what? Put down their enemies and exalt them to be the greatest nation on the earth. So when are, is this destruction going to occur? And what is the sign of your coming? And the word and there is a little Greek word called chi. K A I, Ka. It's a conjunction that brings two things together in equality. And, and, and so basically, what, what they're asking is two questions. When will be these things? What, when, when is this going to happen? What is the sign of, of, of your coming that will announce the end of the age? And so here's how they, they've asked these questions. And now Jesus begins to answer those. Okay? And, and, and he gives them. Uh, a panoramic view it is my understanding, my interpretation, that what he lays out for us in these first initial verses is that first three and a half years of the tribulation period. Then he will what? Talk about that middle event in the tribulation period. And then he will go on to explain some of the things that will occur with the trumpets and the bowls. Let's go. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. Pay attention to that. It's important. Are you listening? Say amen. amen. We live in an age of deception. We live in an age of deception on every level
We are manipulated every day by the world system. We are lied to. We are led to believe certain things that are true that are not true. That is true morally. It's true economically. It's true politically. It's true spiritually. I'm going to say it again. We live in an age of deception. Jesus' biggest warning about the end time is do not be deceived. Why isn't this building full? Why isn't every church that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ full today? Why, why, why are we not having multiple services a day in a time like now? The moral fabric of our country is unraveling at an unprecedented rate. And I'm telling you, and I'm telling you, and I'm warning you, this is the prophetic voice. If America does not come to repentance, judgment is impending. Stop the foolishness of announcing that we are a Christian nation. We are a godless nation. But we were founded. But what we were is not what we are. Can we face the reality that we have turned our back on God? Can we just admit that? The only hope is for us to admit it because the world's already lost in condemnation and deceit. That's why Peter says, let judgment begin at the house of God. Let, let's just deal with us and the idolatry that's in our lives. There can be no call for change in the society until there's change in the church. Listen to me, things aren't okay. That's part of the deception. We believe it's, everything's okay. It's not okay. Look at what's being promoted. Look at what's being normalized. And don't dare say a word about it. Who are you to say anything about it? And what do we do? We stop. We shut up. Get in your corner. Stay in your place. What do we do? That's what we do. That's what we do. Why? Because we got idols in our life. We want to be accepted. We want to be pleasing to everybody. We want everybody to like us. We want everybody to agree with us. We don't want any conflict. So what do we do? Deception. Let no one, take heed, that no one deceives you. Verse 5. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. Remember, Christ isn't his last name. It's a title. The Messiah. The anointed one, the Messiah. There will be many who will say at that time, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Verse 5, verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The end is not yet, verse 6. Verse 7, for nation will rise against nation. That word there is the word we get our word ethnic from. There will be what? Ethnicity wars. We've heard about that, right? Ethnic cleansing Kingdom against kingdom. What? Government against government. There will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the... You just had your first contraction. Now, true, all of these have been characteristic of human history, haven't they? 
It's interesting to me that as Jesus teaches these things, one of the ways that we can know this hasn't happened and yet it is future is what John says in Revelation chapter 6. Notice the parallel here. If you're paying attention to this, he says the first seal, well, let's just read it, Revelation 6. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Now, to put this into its context in the entire book of Revelation, he has already told John, I am going to have you, what? Write things that are and things that are to come. What are the things that are when he writes? Revelation what? Chapter 2 and chapter 3. The seven churches of Asia. Those are the things that are. Then he says, you're going to write things that are to come. When we're in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation, the church is on the earth. I believe then that in chapter 4 and 5, you find the church in heaven. Now you have chapter 6, where what? Something that sounds like the tribulation has started. The, the reason I take it, in my opinion, one of the reasons why I take it so simplistically is I don't think you have to do biblical gymnastics to understand prophecy. I don't, I don't think God gave us prophecy to confuse us. And while it has particular meaning to us today, it is, in my opinion, that it will also be a, 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 a signpost to those who are living through the tribulation. If you can get your hands on a copy of what? The Bible. In the tribulation period, in your language, if you can. If you're at all listening to the 144,000 Jews who are in their evangelist during that time, if you listen to the two witnesses, they're giving you a sign. I want to throw this out here. I wasn't intending to, but I want to throw this out here. How many of you know what a menorah is? A menorah, the, 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 the golden candlestick. Yeah, you got seven lampstands. Some can be nine. In my, in my opinion, there's no accident in that. You have the Apostle Paul, who is the Apostle to the Gentiles. He is the Apostle, not the only one, but the primary Apostle to the body of Christ. And he writes letters to the churches. Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon. You want to know your identity in Christ? Read those letters. You want to know how to be saved? Read those letters. You, you want to understand how to walk in the Spirit? Read those letters. I'm not dismissing the rest of the Bible. I'm just telling you, you, you have an apostle who wrote for the church age. You have 12 Jewish apostles whose primary concern is the nation of Israel. Not, not, not completely. They, they give us great theology too and, and what we should understand. But you'll remember that, that when Peter uh, and James and John, Galatians, when Peter, James, and John met with Barnabas and, and Paul and discussing the gospel, uh, Peter, James, and John extend the right hand of fellowship to Peter or to Paul and Barnabas and say, you, your ministry is clearly to the Gentiles. Go get them, and, and we'll continue to go to the Jew. A, a menorah, a candlestick, is to give light in darkness. Do we agree? After the writing of Philemon, what do you have? The first letter after Philemon is... Hebrews. Anybody know who it's written to? 
There, there's a clue in the name. Hebrews. James. Who does James write to? The 12 tribes scattered abroad. 1 Peter, 2 Peter. Here's how a Jewish believer operates under suffering and persecution to give light to the Gentiles. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. 1 John. 2 John. 3 John. Jude. Revelation. A menorah. The middle of those books, you got four on this side and four on this side, and you got a middle book that stands the tallest. Which one is that? First John. The first time the Antichrist is ever revealed by that name is in First John. What happens at the middle of the tribulation period? The Antichrist comes out and says, I am God and I will be worshipped as God. You will bow to me or I'll kill you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not an accident. The Word of God is not put together archaically. It's put together by the Spirit of God. That is no accident. And while we can learn from all 66 books, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable, but there are certain books for certain times that have significant meaning. And the last nine books of your Bible are, are tremendously important to understand at the end of time. And if you're living at the end of time, and if you're living in the tribulation period, and you want to understand what's going on, if you can find the Bible, everything you need to know will be in those nine. saw the lamb who opened one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying uh, with a voice like thunder what does thunder do we heard it last night boy didn't it sound good man after not having some rain for a while that sounded good didn't it and, and did, were you like me did you did you go out two or three times expecting to see it rain but all you could see was the lightning in the distance and the thunder but I could feel the humidity and I could feel the wind and not hear the thunder, what did I know? There, there's no electricity, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you on buoy cast? Oh, okay. When I heard the thunder, I knew that a storm was coming. When I heard the thunder, I knew there was a storm coming. John heard the four living creatures saying, like thunder. Let, 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 me, let me do my own interpretation of what they said. There's a storm a brewing. Come and see. Come and see what, what, what's coming. Not what's happened. Not what's happened. What's coming. What's coming. I know when the storms re get really severe, I do like you do. What do you do? If I can, I turn on the TV or I get on my phone and, and, and I follow the weather report I, I know what's happening but what I'm concerned about is what's coming what's coming because I can sense by what's happening that I might need to find a hidey hole I need to find some shelter it only makes sense anybody ever been in a tornado you ever been in a hurricane you, let me tell you something You'll find out real quick you ain't much. <laughs> you ain't much. One time I was in the Philippines, and, and, and we go by boat, uh, seven hours by boat to the remote islands to do our ministry. We had been out, and we were coming back, and we hit a storm in the Gulf of Davao. Instead of seven hours, it took us 13 hours to get home. And I remember laying in that bunk in the middle of the night talking to Jesus. Find yourself in a boat in the middle of a storm. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Verse 2. Watch my time here. And, and I looked, and, and behold, not only does he say I looked. Taylor, did you get that? Not only does he say I looked, but he, but he, but he emphasizes it. I looked and behold. It, 
it'd be like last night if a tornado came in down where I'm at off King's Highway. And I, and I, and I open the door because I can hear certain things. And I, I, I have experienced for the last 30 minutes a bunch of things. And, and I open the door and, and, and I'm looking to see what I can see. And behold, a tornado. It's worse than I thought. I look and behold, a white horse. Now, immediately we think, well, that's Jesus. The Calvary's already showed up. Not yet. He won't show up till chapter 19. You, you can't get to the millennial kingdom until you go through the 70th week of Daniel. You can't get to the millennial kingdom until you go through the tribulation period. Now, I'm not talking about us. Where are we? We've already been snatched out. Had a discussion with somebody who wanted to argue with me about that. There ain't no rapture. Okay, well, explain to me how you say it. We're all going to have to go through this, and at the very end of time, Jesus is going to come back, and we're going to go up, meet him in the clouds in there, and then we're coming straight back. It's going to be a dizzy ride. <laughs> On top of the fact that, that there's a lot of factors that you haven't put in that I'm trying to do right now. He said that, that he saw a, a white horse. Uh, he who sat on it had a bow. Not what you put in your little girl's hair. But a weapon. He has a bow. He had a bow. But, but notice it doesn't say he had any arrows. He has a bow. But he doesn't have any arrows. He had a crown, but the crown is not a diadem. It's a victor's crown, but it's not a diadem. This one is of not royal blood. This is a fake. This one's a fake. He has no royal blood. He had a crown given to him. The sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. None of what we're seeing even today is outside of the sovereignty of your God. Do you realize where we are globally? These are perilous times. I'm prophetically warning you right now. It's, it's about to get ugly. You see, what we've been led to believe is that somehow we're going to just make it right to the rapture, be comfortable, be fat and sassy, and everything's going to go our way, and then God's going to jerk us out, and then all hell's going to break loose. Let me tell you something. The world has gone through hell before. Some of you lived through it. World War II... No small deal. You thought 2020 was something. I'm telling you prophetically, get ready. Get ready. Have you walked into Walmart down your freezer aisle? H have you seen that there are days in the afternoon and the evening there's nothing left? Do you realize that the Chinese are shutting down distribution for weeks at a time? Get you an app. You can look at it for yourself. All of the boats, cargo ships, oil tankers in the other side of the world, stacked up. Not moving anywhere. Why? Because they, they, they shut stuff down. Check out the west coast of the United States. There was a time a few months ago where what? It was clogged, full of ships. Check it out now. That, that, what, what am I telling you? That they, they have delivered their goods and they're gone. Or given up and gone. And nothing else is coming over. 
That, that's, not, that's not me doing propaganda. That's just fact. Fuel increases. We, we're more than doubled. What does that do to the cost of transportation? What's that do to the cost of groceries? What's that do to... Just, just in the last two weeks, I've read some of the economists who have thrown three things out. We talked about high inflation. Then we talked about recession. Now they're talking about stagflation. What is that? Stagflation is when you have growing interest rates simultaneously with higher unemployment. We lived through it in the late 70s early 80s. What does that mean? The cost of goods is increasing and people are losing their jobs. On top of that, now you have a shortage of goods. The problem with stagflation is that in the attempt by the Fed, we've seen this historically, the attempt of the Fed to what? increase interest rates to try to handle the economic pressures they're creating more and more unemployment you see if things stay with me it's just logical it, 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 if you if you if it costs more to buy it you're not buying as much which means if i'm a business owner i don't need as many employees On top of that, if I'm not getting goods, what am I going to sell to you anyway? My prophetic word to you. How long in the last four years, how many times, for those of you who have been here for most of the last three or four years, how many times have I said, what are you going to do when you can't go to the doctor what are you going to do when you can't go to the grocery store? Raise your hand if you've heard me say that. If you've heard me say it multiple times. That's a prophetic word. You see, all of a sudden, your relationship with Christ is going to get serious. Because now, you can't live in unbelief of spiritual things, nor can you go to a man to fix it. Can I warn you something real quick? Don't try to pour a foundation when it's raining. The time for you to get serious about your relationship with Christ, the time to understand his word, the time to know how to stand, the time to know how to get on your face before God and to, and to, to speak to God to meet your needs, you, you better get that down and learn that now. That's why the book of Hebrews chapter 5, this is totally off of the sermon, but I believe it's of the Lord. Romans chapter 5 says what? We are to exercise our senses to maturity. What's he talking about? You need to be disciplined and mature in spiritual things or you will not survive. We've been playing church a long time, haven't we? I'm talking to my pastor friend back here. We've been playing church a long time, haven't we? We got fat, we got sassy. We got complacent. We got proud. We became idolatrous. And if the church doesn't wake up, judgment is coming. And rightfully so. Two major political parties in America. One is openly rebellious to the things of God. And the other only uses God to get a vote. I don't care if you're red or you're blue. Evil. Evil. Stop believing the lies. Do not be deceived. 
Stop believing lies every four years. They're liars. They're liars. They're liars. You've got to learn to listen to one voice and watching four and five hours of TV every night instead of being in the Word of God is going to get you in trouble. You say, well, I don't watch dirty things. It ain't about watching dirty things. It's about wasting time. And on top of that, we don't have the heart of the Father. Let me, let me preach to us. We don't have the heart of the Father. You say, what is that? Read the story of the prodigal son. Neither one of them knew the heart of the Father. The prodigal left and found himself in a bad spot and in his heart said what? If I can just get back to my father, I can at least be a servant. He didn't know the father's heart. When he came back, he had a speech prepared. But before he could get the speech out, what did the father do? Ran to him and embraced him. And the, and the Greek tells us what? He kissed him over and over and over and over and over and over. Smelt like a freaking pig. And embraces him and tells the servant, bring Another robe. This is about all I can handle. Whew. You need a bath, by the way. Bring him, bring him a robe. Bring him shoes. Bring him a ring. He didn't know the father's heart. He learned it. What about the elder brother? The, the elder brother in the parable, by the way, represents the Pharisees. By the way, he represents most church people today. Because when the father said, hey, we're throwing a party for your brother. He that was lost has now been found. What did he say? Well, you never gave me a party. You never killed the fatted calf. Matter of fact, he, go, he says it this way. He says, not only did you kill the fatted calf for the whoremonger who wasted his inheritance... Your son, not my brother, did that, by the way. You didn't even give me a goat. And I've been here playing by the rules the whole time. Self-righteous. I know we don't have the heart of the Father because it doesn't break our hearts that outside those doors are 60,000 people, most of which are lost. I'm talking about in your town, your town. Did you hear me? Your town, my town, Texarkana, 60,000 people in the city limits of Arkansas, Texarkana, Arkansas, and Texarkana, Texas are lost. Most of them are lost and going to hell, and we have an invitation. We can't even stay five minutes longer to come to the altar and pray for them. Much less go out and tell them. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, it ain't going to be any better next week. You know what's coming. You say, why are you so mad? I'm not mad. I'm just serious. And one of the reasons I'm serious is because I got out there in that muck and mire, and I know what it does to people. <clears throat> God in his mercy called me back, and I promised him I wouldn't play. Let me see how much I can get done in 10 minutes. Give me 10 minutes, all right? All right. I look and behold a white horse. That's the Antichrist. Shouldn't surprise us. Go back to Matthew chapter 6. Do not be deceived. Many will say, I am the Christ. There's your parallel. Here we are, right? Uh, white horse, crown. He went out to conquer. Verse 3. So the first seal is what? The coming of the Antichrist. Read Daniel chapter 9. The Antichrist is probably already here. He's probably already here. But, but his notoriety will be established when he signs a peace treaty with Israel. That's further developed later. He opened the second seal, and I heard a second living creature saying, come and see. There's another horse. This one is what? Fiery red. 
fiery red. It, it went out. It was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. The second seal is what? War. What did Jesus say? There, there'll be nations against nations, governments against governments. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. That's not the end. That's just the beginning. What, what, what's happening right now in the world? You paying attention? You got Russia and Ukraine. You got threats of war with new nations coming into NATO. You got, oil, you got gas lines being cut off to Poland and to Ukraine. You, you've got the, the Chinese that rattle their sabers every week. Wars and rumors of wars. What I'm telling you is, these things, we're not in the tribulation, but these are things that give us some idea of what it's, it's going to be like. And again, let me remind you, don't believe that you're going to get out of this without hard times. I mean, think about it. Think about just American history. The United States became a superpower after World War II. It ended in 45. The reason that we became basically a world power outside of the sovereignty of God, only looking at things naturally, if you will, is that Europe was destroyed. So it gave us the means to be what? An economic power. And we did. We took advantage of it. We converted what? Munitions plants and airplane plants and tank plants uh, and all of that and started making what? Washing machines and dryers and things that people would buy. And we became an economic engine. And if you really wanted to do business anywhere in the world, what would you have to do? You'd have to probably do it through an American. And we began to what? Develop relationships outside. So we became what? An economic power. And then we had the Cold War, so we had to worry about the Russians or the former Soviet Union. And so what did we do? We began to build up our military. So within the sovereignty of God, we became who we were. We didn't do it because we're that smart. We've lived in unprecedented economic prosperity like no one in the history of the world has ever known. But that is not the case for most of our history. We are, we are living in a mirage. It's about to collapse. How in the world do you send $40 billion overseas when you're $28 trillion in debt? You're not on a gold standard, so you're just printing paper. And it will last long enough until what? Don't worry about the Chinese. Don't worry about the Russians. Don't worry about the Iranians. Don't worry about the Iraqis. You, you got one person to worry about, and it's God of the heavens. And you do understand we can't get to the tribulation and globalism until we do away with America. You can't have a nationalistic, proud, strong America and accomplish those things unless we're party to it. I'll throw this out. That Babylon great that is destroyed in a moment, we talk about America may not be in prophecy. Oh, she may very well be in prophecy. But not the way we want. I mean, I know you're not coming back next week. So I can stay as long as I want, right? Right, I mean, I know you're not coming back because you got your feelings hurt. Preacher was mad and told me I wasn't obeying God and I'll just stay home and show him next week. Listen, back in 2020, I preached to empty chairs, all right? All right. I know you're better than that. I'm just picking at you. 
All right, uh, this, is, this seal here is war. The Antichrist is the first seal. War is the second seal. What's the third seal? When he opened the third seal, I heard a third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. This sounds some vaguely familiar. Verse 6, uh, I heard a voice in the midst of living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. What are we talking about there? Famine. By the way, famine always follows war. Why does famine always follow war? Well, beyond the destruction, you don't have time to plant because you're fighting for your life. So that what naturally follows every war is famine. And, and, and what? What, what? What happens to the cost of food when there's a shortage? Uh, a denarius was a common man's daily wage. In other words, listen to me, he'll work all day long just to get by. He'll work all day long just to make sure that his kids have something to eat. I've seen it. When I first went over to Romania after the fall of communism and we began to preach evangelism, I, I have been there where the economic system was broken. I wish I'd have brought one. I, had, I have a, 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 it's called a hundred lei, L-E-I, a hundred lei. I have a bunch of those coins. They, they, they were minted in 1975, and they are light as this piece of paper. When they are as light as that piece of paper. Nothing to it, nothing to it. And a hundred lei is equivalent to a hundred dollars. A, a lay is a dollar. Okay? You ever go into a convenience store and you see the little thing there that says, need a penny, take a penny, got a penny, leave a penny? That's what people were doing with those hundred lay. You follow me? It'd be like you leaving a hundred dollars laying there. Why? It wasn't worth the paper it was printed on. Now, on top of that, I was going into places, John, there was no food. I'm talking about no food. No food. Right now, you can go out there, you can go to the grocery store, you can go to a restaurant, you got the resources to do it. I've seen it. I've seen it where people would stand in line three and four hours at a time in the brutal cold of winter in Brashov, Romania, brutally cold, three hours, hoping to be able to get a loaf of potato bread to take home. Inflation rate was so bad, my second trip over there, the West had arrived. What do I mean by that? America had shown up. What do I mean by that? We got McDonald's now. Two years earlier, we're waiting on potato bread. Now what? U.S. government's funded the Romanian government. American businesses are going in. Now we got us a little economic engine. We got us a McDonald's. And I ordered me a cheeseburger, fries, and a small Coke. And when it came up on that little uh, machine there and told me how much it was, are you ready? It was 13,540 lei. I felt like a drug lord because <laughs> I'd exchange a $100 American bill and I'd get a wad of their money. It wasn't worth nothing, but boy, I sure felt like something. <laughs> Famine. Let me tell you, don't be saying that's way out there. Yeah, it's going to happen in the tribulation, but I'm telling you, shortages shortages fear not my little children fear not who's your father does the sermon on the mount make any sense now i'm gonna end with this okay we, we can't go any further we'll have to pick up next week i want i want to end with this does the sermon on the mount make any sense Take no thought for tomorrow, Jesus said. 
Do not ask, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For your Father in heaven knows you have need of such things. The one who clothes the lily of the field is clothes them in greater glory than any of Solomon's clothes. And the sparrow, if he knows of the sparrow, now what? Stop. He knows the sparrow, but the bigger question for us is, does, does he know you? And that question begs, do you know him? Your religion's not going to get you very far. Not going to get you very far. But, Seek ye first the next series on Amazon Prime. Listen to me. People got more excited about the next season of Yellowstone than coming to church. You think Kevin Costner cares whether you eat or not? You think anybody in Hollywood cares what you eat or not? If that's your idol, you better hope he answers. Well, I think Kevin Costner is nice. Not saying he isn't. I don't know the man. But I'm telling you what, we're wasting time when we better be grounded. Well, I know the mind can only take what the rear can endure. <laughs> so I'm going to ask our musicians to come forward. By the way, if you want more of this, I'll be back in person live here at the Oasis <laughs> next Sunday. You know, I'm just telling you this simply because I love you. And I know sometimes I can come off kind of cocky and I can kind of come off, all, you know, it's just part of the presentation. But the truth of the matter is I love you and I can see what's coming. And I'm going to go ahead and say this. Part of the reason my heart is so heavy is because I got my own kids and grandkids that need to get this message. So if you're watching, if you're watching, I love you. I'm your daddy and your pops. And I don't think you're ready for what's coming. I'm not saying you're not saved, and I'm saying you're not going to heaven. On top of that, you got my grandkids. We did what we did. We, we poured into you. We took you to church. We did the best we could to live it out in front of you. Yeah, we made our mistakes, but we did our best to live it out in front of you. We took you to church. And you don't even have my grandkids in church? Come on. I love you. You think my grandkids are going to know Jesus just because you do? I know some of you are facing the same thing. Man, your kids are just not where they need to be. Can I speak to every man here? Step up. Don't wait on mama to say it. Don't wait on Grammy to say it. Step up. Tell them. You need to be in church. You need to be in the Word. You need to know how to worship. You need to know how to walk in the Spirit. You need to know how to recognize His voice because it's coming soon. And for us, man, let's... Let, let, let's get the heart of the Father. If 
you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ is your Savior, let me tell you, He is coming again. If you do not know for certain, I'm talking about 100%. If I was in a plane and they told me there's three parachutes and only one out of the three work, I don't like those odds. If they told me two out of three work, I don't like those odds. You know what I want? Three out of three. <laughs> Let me tell you what, with Jesus, it's three out of three. You can know, and we invite you to know him today. For the rest of us who know Christ, may our hearts be broken for a world that is on a collision course with the God of the universe. As we stand and as we sing, we invite you to come.